first up, we have Dr. Megan Hall, who's joining me today to talk about her experience with sour rot. Megan holds a PhD in plant pathology and plant microbe biology from Cornell University and spent collectively seven years on groundbreaking research um, focused on the causes of sour rot. So prior to this research, growers' tools for managing sour rot were very limited um, because the causal organisms of the disease were not very well known. Uh, Megan is here to talk about her work and give us some advice today. Megan is now an independent science communication specialist and consultant for Vineyards. Welcome, Megan. Hi, Fritz. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Great. Yeah, it's good to see you here. Let's let's get started with you. If you could tell our listeners a little more about yourself, um, and let's start with how you got so focused on sour rot, and then maybe a little yeah. bit about what you're doing these days. Absolutely. So I was uh, a grad student of Dr. Wayne Wilcox at uh, Cornell before he retired, sadly, in 2018. Um, but I, you know, came on as Wayne's grad student, he gave me two options for projects that I really wanted to undertake. And one was trunk disease and would have entailed some really cool travel trips down to Australia. But the other was sour rot. And the thing that intrigued me most about sour rot was that we knew so little about it. It was a big problem in the Finger Lakes at the time, and it's still a big problem in a lot of parts of the United States um, and other parts of the world as well in Europe and, and down in Tasmania, where I ended up spending six months. Um, so it did entail some cool travel after all. But uh, it was just a black box. And sort of like, hey, what can we find out about this? What cool research can we do to to uncover some of the causal organisms of this and um, and also management strategies? So it was just a really intriguing and fun project uh, right from the get go. So let's just get started. Let's do a little bit of basics for our listeners with a little bit of sour rot 101, so to speak. Um, Let's start with the, the basic questions. What exactly is sour rot? Um, what are the signs that we should be looking for in the vineyard? And why and how does it occur? I'm gonna ask a little bit about the organisms and the insect involvement next, but in general, uh, what are we looking for and, and why does it show up? So you're gonna notice that you have sour rot in your vineyard when you smell it, probably before you even see it. So that is the defining characteristics. And that's really what we came in with um, as information, when I first started on sour rot, you know, years and years ago at this point, 10 years ago now, um, was, you know, we knew that something was happening because we would go into a vineyard block and you smell the vinegar. Um, and then you'd say, where is that coming from? Let's go find those clusters and see what, what is going on. So you smell it first and then you see it and you see that discoloration of the berry skin. It's sort of that light brown, no matter what variety, red or white, you're going to see that like oxidizing of the grape skin, which really just turns it a weird, funky color. Um, it sort of kind of looks like botrytis or you're, something like that, but it, it smells really bad. It's the pungent smell of that acetic acid. And that's your first, first clue that something is up. Um, yeah. Vinegar yeah. smells in the vineyard is not something you want to smell close to no. harvest. We're not making vinegar <laughs> or salad dressing. We're making wine right. um, and even a little bit of it. I mean, what is considered acceptable in, in um, a harvest? Could you have 1% or 5% sour rot before it becomes an issue for volatile acidity and problems with the wine? Anyone ever put a number on that? Yeah. So the legal limit for, for volatile acidity or for acid for that in your grapes is 1.2 grams per liter, which is a lot. That's a lot of vinegar. You don't want that level of acetic acid in your wine to begin with, but that's the legal limit for where it's no longer acceptable. Really, you can start smelling it way below that. I mean, it's a really potent compound and um, and so you can you can really uh, start to smell it at some really early stages. That being said, your grapes on the vine, and we're gonna we can talk about this in a minute, but you're they're an active microbial factory in there, and you're getting low levels of fermentation and oxidation in even healthy berries. So you're always gonna have like a little bit of these, but it's when it starts to accumulate and you see the effects on the outside of the berries where you see that oxidation that you know that. That's a red flag. That's something's up. I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into the role that insects and microorganisms play in causing and spreading sour rot. You've done a lot of research on this aspect of sour rot in particular. So 
Do growers need to know about the organisms that cause sour rot? And do canopy management practices or other cultural practices do other cultural practices play a role? Um, so just give us the, it's not just, you know, damaged berries that are the issue. There's other things that have to happen for this sour rot complex. And that's why we call it the complex, right? So what's involved yeah. in the complex? So there's three main things that contribute to sour rot. One is the yeast that is growing inside the berries and on the surface of the berries at all parts during the season. But when that yeast comes in contact with the pulp in the berries, it uh, ferments, you get some sugars. If there are also acetic acid bacteria, which is your number two, acetic acid bacteria present, it will take that ethanol that is produced by the yeast, it will oxidize it and will produce acetic acid. Number three is this is all mediated by fruit flies that, and those are, for those of you who are in different parts of the world, uh, vinegar flies, Drosophila specifically, because those can always be called different names depending on where you are, but fruit flies, Drosophila, um, that are laying eggs inside the berry pulp and they're expediting this reaction. And so it's not just your normal little bit of fermentation, little bit of oxidation at tolerable levels that we can handle, this is, you know, they are laying their eggs in there. Those uh, eggs are pupating and we are, we're seeing the larva crawl around and their populations are exploding. And meanwhile, these acetic acid levels are building up at a really like huge rate <laughs> uh, and also causing this oxidation of the very skin. And then the pungent vinegar smell that we, that we smell coming from these clusters. So those are the main, main uh, components of this of this complex. Are there some cultural practices, canopy management, things we can do to, to influence the cluster morphology to prevent some of that damage um, that, that the organisms are taking advantage of? Yeah, so, you know, of the three causal organisms that we have, the yeast, the bacteria, and the fruit flies, the main thing you can influence is the fruit flies. And so, you know, you can't do a whole lot about those, those native yeast and acetic acid bacteria populations, but you can do something about the fruit flies. And culturally, what you can do is fruit flies don't love windy open air environments. They love feeling protected. They like being under leaf cover. They like, you know, sort of uh, nice, cozy homes where they can make their next generation. And so your biggest tool that you can use is opening up that canopy. So doing leaf removal, um, you know, aggressive leaf removal in some cases. Um, and I would say even early season to, uh, if you can do any sort of, uh, any management to reduce cluster compactness, that is going to be key. So anything you can do to reduce berries from pushing up against each other and reducing the availability of nice cozy homes for Drosophila to make later in the season, and so really getting that airflow into the canopy, reducing the humidity if you, if you can, and you know, just removing leaf layers is going to be your big way of doing that. So I would say early season leaf removal and even later season leaf removal um, just to maintain an open canopy and really get that airflow going.